All right. Mic check, check. I'm good. So I'm Max Ron. Max Max Ron. CWB Association Welding Podcast. Pod, pod, podcast. Today we have a really cool guest. Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Ron and I'm with you guys as always here to talk life stories about people in the industry all around the world. And today's guest, we have Pat Adams, who has been with Rock Mount Welding and Alloys and Research. I think there's a few variations of the name now for, well, he was saying over 40 years. So, um, Pat, how are you doing? I'm doing real well. Thanks for having me on. All right, Pat. So for people who don't know, um, I guess, who you are, let's start there. Let's let's get some some backstory here. So, Pat, where were you born? Where do you come from? I come from a suburb of Chicago. Uh, my dad was a welder in the Army back in the in the 40s and during World War Two, came back to Naperville, Illinois, started a welding company. And so I grew up in the welding world uh, with with a uh, a lot of time out in the shop. <laughs> yeah, that's that we share that. My dad was a welder too, so you kind of get dragged into it one way or another. You do. <laughs> you do. So, so you know, Chicago. I, my my wife loves Chicago. It's probably her favorite American city that that we go to. And you know, for for yourself coming up in that area, um, you know, did you? What was your plan as a kid coming up? Like, did you, did you think you were going to go to university? You know, like what, what was young Pat coming up in, in, in Illinois doing? Well, young Pat was, was, uh, hooking, driving tractors around the shop, uh, uh, connecting, uh, 55 gallon drums to the overhead crane and, and riding around and, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the drum above the workers, <laughs> making a pest of myself. Uh, I was always mechanical because I came from that world and wanted to uh, always loved the mechanical world and mechanical people. I mm-hmm. uh, figured that I would probably go to college uh, after uh, uh, I'd, I'd grown up a bit. My dad ended up getting out of the welding business. We moved from Chicago up to Wisconsin and one day he came home, then he was selling real estate, uh, had a real estate company, um, and uh, came home and said, I'm leaving, and you guys can come with me if you want, but I'm not staying because it's too cold in Wisconsin. <laughs> so I moved, we're moving to Arizona. So we all moved down to Arizona, and that's where I finished my college, and, uh, and then started with Rock Mount, and that was in 1977. So what did you go to college for? Uh, that's an interesting story. I, I, uh, I, I had two uh, areas that I, my studies uh, led me to. One was psychology. One was philosophy. Uh, my first job interview after college, the interviewer told me that I was doubly suited to be unemployed the rest of my life. So... <laughs> Well, you know, uh, Pat, you're going to love this. I went to university for philosophy and I minored in classics. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) And look at us now. (laughs) Look at us now. Well, I always tell everybody I wasn't smart enough to become a welder, so I had to become a salesman. (laughs) So, So you're coming out of college now and, you know, you're kind of you know, a higher minded education, but not practically suited is a good way to put it. And, uh, and you're looking for jobs. How did you land in Rock Mount? Like in 73, Rock Mount must've been in its infancy. You know, what was Rock Mount then? And how did you get drawn in? Well, Rock Mount started in 72. I graduated in 77. Uh, I was looking for a job. I was working two jobs to pay the bills. Um, and, uh, I, I, found a uh, job service, a headhunter, and they found this company that was looking for college graduates who had some welding experience. And I thought, heck, if that's all all I need, then I'm qualified for that job for sure. 
got a <laughs> phone call and and rock mount was in its infancy then um uh, got a phone call from the owner he flew me up from phoenix where i was living up to denver interviewed me gave me a job and told me that i was going to move from phoenix to missouri uh, which i thought was a little bit crazy but i wanted that job so that's mm -hmm how I got started with, with rock map. And what was that first position at rock map? Was it a sales position? It was a sales guy. I, I went to a territory in Missouri, moved everything I had, which is, wasn't much, uh, uh, to Missouri from Arizona thought, boy, I, I think I'm going the wrong direction. Everybody <laughs> in Missouri wanted to go to Arizona and I was going the other way, but I got a start and it was a territory without any accounts. We were a very young company. Back then, we were competing with Eutectic. So yes. Eutectic was the giant uh, in the in elephant in the room, and we were just a, a little company. And, and so I was out in the field talking to farmers or anyone who would look at me. Uh, the first day I was in Missouri, I was parked in a parking lot in, in a small town. The local policeman saw me sitting there and realized I didn't look like I was from there and immediately came over and asked me what I was doing. <laughs> and interestingly enough, I told him uh, that I was selling welding materials. He said, you should talk to my brother. He runs the maintenance department at the city. And that was one of my first sales. <laughs> so, awesome. You know, <laughs> and, yeah, and so you I know, started off as a sales guy. It's uh, for the people that are listening, you know, save you a little bit of a Google search here. You know, Rock Mount is in the kind of the same game of specialty consumables. So consumables that are specially designed to either meet or exceed um, uh, standards or whatever standards are required. Uh, and they're looking to get into certain niches. Uh, you mentioned Eutectic, which is a, 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 a rod I've used before. There was, and the times I've used those rods, in Canada were for hard surfacing or specialty repair of cast equipment or, you know, um, field repairs of things that were really rusty or dirty or oily or covered in paint and to save on some of that process or pre welding process. And, and rock mount is very much in that same game, correct? We are. Our idea is that there are two categories of welding that happen every day. The biggest one and the one where most of the welding materials get used every day is in fabrication and production welding, mm -hmm. where there are specifications and you know exactly what you're you're doing. And the welder is a professional more than likely. But there's another very large part of the welding world that we call maintenance welding. This is repair welding of equipment where things aren't so perfect, mm -hmm. where the metal can be dirty, you can be out of position probably more commonly than, than not. Uh, and very commonly, you don't even know what kind of metal you're welding on exactly. You can guess it's steel, but they all look the same to a large degree, and mm -hmm. they're not the same. And so our products are designed to be used with that idea that fabrication welding is different than maintenance welding, and that you might get a better result that will save more downtime and labor by using a product that's made for what you're doing. And, you know, just uh, for some context, I I worked in a steel mill in maintenance for uh, almost a decade. And in a steel mill, there's water constantly flowing to cool materials, and it's literally pouring everywhere. And there's grease and oil everywhere to protect the machinery from the water. Right. So everywhere you go, you're in six inches of grease with a two inch layer of water on top. And because of the speed and, and, and heat involved, the machinery breaks down daily. And you like, I mean, I later on in my career, I ended up in a fab shop. We would order the same four consumables on pallets daily. Right. When I was working maintenance, we had a fridge <laughs> and this fridge had 40 different rods from different companies in Europe, Russia, Australia, things that people had picked up at trade shows, and they all had little handwritten notes on them. This one's good for the piece of machinery in the North Bay because of whatever. And it's part of it is not 
not just not knowing the weld material, but also the date it was produced. The steel made 40 years ago, 20 years ago, and today is different, right? You yeah, know, I'm there sure. was there was more ore on, on the planet 40 years ago, so the steel had a much more pure context. Today, the steel is very recycled, you mm-hmm. know? So you don't know what you're getting into with an old piece of steel. You really have no idea. It's so common, and and interestingly enough, and the reason that we are are so passionate about explaining what we do to people is that most welders, whether you're a fabricator or a maintenance welder, came from a fabrication training perspective. In other words, if you want to weld on something dirty, you use a a, a 6010 or a 5P or whatever it may be. And if you want something a little bit stronger, use a 7018. But those products, and there's nothing wrong with them in any way, but they were never really made for what a maintenance guy in a steel mill is doing. Mm -hmm. They were made to fit a specification. They were made with the idea that as long as they fit that spec, they're perfect and you follow the process and procedure. Most maintenance guys can't really do that. And trying to fit that kind of welding product into the maintenance world will very commonly work perfectly. But there's also a portion of it that doesn't work well at all. Yeah, and you can get quite one. frustrated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the way we see it is in a fabrication situation, the big costs are are the cost of the welding material. You really want to know, does it fit our specification? And what does that product cost uh, mm-hmm. to buy the, the maintenance or the, the welding material? But in the maintenance world, you have a completely different set of factors that are very important. Downtime, labor, replacement part costs. Can we fix it? If we fix it and it breaks again, are we, are we, are we on the, on the well, chain for that? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and from a welder's perspective, everyone, every welder that I know has pride in what he or she does when they, when they make their weld, it's like signing their name to have a, using the wrong welding product to make a repair and possibly have it fail can it's, it hurts. Um, I always, I always make the analogy that you can, you can uh, pound a nail in with a rock or a hammer. Hammers cost a lot of money relative to rocks. Rocks are available. They're free. They're laying on the ground. But if you're a carpenter, uh, you're, you're not going to go pick up a rock. You're going to invest in a hammer. It's the right tool for the job. And that's the world that we try to fit in. You know, I love that analogy of the weld is your signature. I'm going to, I'm going to steal that from you. I like that. <laughs> You're welcome to it. Because, uh, you know, that, that's something very true. And welders are trained to think like that right from day one, whether you go to school or not, because we are the most invigilated trade on the, in the market. You know, no other trade, like no construction trade or or field trade has the amount of testing certification and standards that welders need to follow it's it's unreal the amount of stuff we need to follow so being proud of our weld is a part of our ego but also part of keeping our job (laughs) exactly it's it's very much uh, uh dependent on us being employed now i have a question and i you may be able to answer it but because i think you were in the company early enough but how does someone even think about getting into this game of creating alloys in welding, in the welding spectrum of consumables? I mean, you just wake up one day and say, I want to make a better rod, you know, like, and, and, and you know the ownership there, you know the, the players. So how does that happen? Yeah. Well, the, the, the eutectic was really the, the, uh, originator of this idea back way back when, when metals and metal alloys uh, at one time in our not too distant history were like the computers of today. Mm-hmm. If you look at any of the of the base metal 
uh, books that you'll find, uh, they very commonly have people's names as part of, of the name of that alloy. And the reason is that metals were so much part of the industrial revolution. Eutectic uh, and the folks that started that realized that they're, they could make better welding products. And rock mount uh, was in the same boat. We, we realized that we could make these welding products uh, more in the States than overseas, mm -hmm. and that we thought we could be competitive uh, from a price perspective with products that were similar. So it was the identification of a niche of the welding world, this idea that fabrication welding products are not necessarily the proper tool for what a maintenance guy uses. And so there was an understanding that, hey, maybe there's a business here. So was one of the original, you know, company starters, a chemist, a metallurgist, you know, what's the team you're going to have to hire to, and then you have this great idea and it's like, okay, well now what do I need to do this? Like, I mean, well, interestingly enough, the, the originator of many of these products was a metallurgist and was able to identify these products, uh, uh, and, and the alloys very, when you look at a welding rod, they all look pretty much the same. And, and, uh, we always make the analogy to a cake. If four of us have the same materials to make a cake, we're probably going to end up with four different cakes and welding products are made the same way. So it's not only the alloy that goes into the welding material, but also how it's made, how that those products go in and when, and in what amount. So it's a it's a technical uh, process of trying to fit that idea that there are certain things we want to do. When we think of maintenance welding, we think of dirty, out of position, unidentifiable metal welded by either a really experienced welder or possibly someone who just welds because they have to. And so when you de develop these products, you're shooting towards those points. We came up with the welding products to do it. And then to answer your question, maybe a little more directly, you, you start building these welding materials and you hire a sales force who goes out and says, hey, listen, this Try is not the same yeah. stuff as what you're using, mm -hmm. and it's going to cost you a little bit more money to buy, but it won't be more to use, and it will be the cheapest thing you could ever do, just like a rock is less than a hammer. Yeah, and, and so you know that, that's where we came from. And that's and you know that's that's very valid. So, for example, when I started in welding, I did lots of uh, cast iron repairs. A lot of the old machinery is in cast iron, so things would crack, you have to break. And there would be dozens of trip like tips and tricks from the old, you know, drill out the crack ends, you know, grind it out, preheat, get the oil out because they'd be saturated in oil because of the cast. You know, it's it's you know it's got lots of voids in it, and then you would use a nye rod, which is just a straight nickel cast iron. You right. pour that in there, but it's got no elasticity. So then you throw a seventy eighteen on top, then you grind that out, and then you throw another nye rod on top, and they would call it buttering. And you would butter layers of hard material with soft material in order to weld out the cast so that it wouldn't crack again. And when I, you know, so I have sampled many of the rock mount products and I've used Eutectic and I've used Eagle Alloys, which is now an, an, another player in the game of, of uh, the specialty metals. And every one of these companies, including yours, has exactly that rod now, a hard cast repair with better elasticity at a higher tensile, literally the rod that I needed 20 years ago. You know what I mean? Right. right. Well, and that's the whole idea. If we can develop products that make that maintenance welder's job easier, faster, and make the repair more durable, then everybody's winning. Uh, these products are, are very highly alloyed and they are designed to be used without having any special process and procedure required. Your, your technique 
uh, of repairing cast that you learned. My dad taught me that same one. Uh, and and it's it's interesting. It's very much like the idea uh, of Hadfield manganese. You know that with manganese steel, you have this Hadfield level of manganese is 11 to 14 percent manganese content in carbon steel that all of a sudden makes a carbon steel this crazy metal that will get hard when you beat it. And if you heat it up and let it cool slowly, it will get brittle <laughs> and it wears like crazy, but it's soft underneath. Um, you know, if you think of everything that uh, that that kind of metal does, that's a good analogy for our kinds of products. Always pointing towards those, say, trying to be better on those four points of what a maintenance welder does. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've already gone 20 minutes here, so it's time for our little commercial break here. So we'll take a break. We'll be right back here with Pat Adams from Rock Mount. It's a great conversation. We're picking his brain with his knowledge here, and, and we'll be right back. So stay tuned to the CWB Association podcast. And we're back here at the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Saron. Thanks for tuning in. We have a fantastic conversation going on with Pat Adams from Rock Mount. We're kind of up to this point, we've talked a little bit about the history of, of Pat and getting into Rock Mount and also a little bit of how Rock Mount decided to stake their claim in the world of consumables and, 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 and what's going on. Now I'm a little bit curious about the structure. Let's get a little, you know, Rock Mount is an American company. I think, I think they're based, where are they based out of? We started in Denver, Colorado. That's okay. uh, where our, our warehouse still is, but uh, in the early 80s, we moved the main office to Vancouver, Washington, and uh, we were owned by uh, a, uh, uh, a, we were a privately owned company by uh, uh, one gentleman. Um, actually, there were two in the beginning, and then it ended up being one. And just then, a couple of years ago, we, the, the owner that started the company uh, decided that it was time for him to move the company down the road. We wanted to never change. We wanted to stay in this business. Uh, and so the company was sold to a Canadian organization called Tricor and uh, a wonderful group of, of uh, guys. Everyone in Rock Mount is super excited about it because uh, I, I think after, after call it 40, uh, six years of doing the same thing in the same way, very, uh, uh profitable and, uh, uh, respected company, but a lot to learn about the future. And mm -hmm. so, uh, Tricor, Chuck Cosman, Mark Townsend, uh, with Tricor have, uh, just brought a, a huge wealth of knowledge and ability and, and forward thinking into the company. So we're in a new chapter as well. Uh, we're going to, over the next year, be moving uh, more deeply into the Canadian market uh, and internationally. Uh, it's an exciting time for us. You know, I was going to bring that up because, you know, I've been in this game a long time. My dad was a welder and a boiler maker, so I've been in this game before I was even born. <laughs> and, you know, I haven't seen Rock Mount. And I have lots of American friends, and uh, you know, like for for well decades now. And as soon as I said, "Hey, you know, I, I've I've connected the CWB Association with Rock Mount. This is a new endeavor for us. We're trying to create some partnerships here." And I've talked to the fellows at at Tricorp, and you know, the, they're super excited to help uh, get involved with the Canadian welding scene, and you know, using you know our organization to do that. And they were all like, we've been using Rock Mount for decades. What are you talking about? It's the only, when you're working, I, well, a friend of mine does bucket repair. He's like, I only use Rock Mount for bucket repair. I was like, really? I've done tons of bucket repair and I never heard of it. And I always had access to the European stuff. And that is a conversation in Canada that needs to happen with America in terms of our standards differences. Because I've actually been investigating into this a little bit. The reason we have so many affiliations with European consumables companies is because we share standards with them. So ISO is transferable into CSA very easily, and we have these agreements back and forth. So when a Canadian supply company is offering you rods, and I say, well, I want something for hard surfacing, 
they ping it on their computer and these options will come up from a European company. So Eutectic or Eagle Alloys, which is also made in Europe. Now, Rock Mount doesn't come up on that list. And I, mm -hmm. and I talked to, to, you know, um, Gerald and, you know, some of the guys at Rock Mount about, you know, how can we, how can we work on this or how, what is the solution? What is in your perspective, the plan now to get into Canada, to get your guys' product into the hands of Canadian workers? Well, this is, this outreach and and thank you very much for asking me on because this is a big part of it letting people know that there is another option uh and that we've got a very good reputation uh a, another big part of it is having a sales force in canada and if it hadn't been for covid and we could travel a little bit more easily we would be a year down this road already but mm -hmm. That will be a big part of it, where we have sales reps in the field talking with people who are doing this kind of work uh, and explaining to them why these products can work and where. The, the development of a, a penetration into more of the standards uh, and being more visible, uh, we're just really on the, on the, uh, the, the, beginning part of yeah but, and you know and, and that's something I, I discussed too is uh, i asked uh who is a, a fantastic fellow with the beard and, and the sales guy and what was his the younger guy i forget his name he works for you guys but we talked and, but e and everybody I, everybody has a beard this year <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess that's the white guy with a beard that doesn't narrow it down at all so. oh i know him <laughs> and i was asking him i said well how does this relate to a 4918, which is a Canadian version of a 7018. You know, you know, what does this relate in terms of standards? Because that's the first thing people are going to ask me. They're going to say, well, what standards does this meet? And he was like, well, we need to still kind of work that out in terms of what the, the, the presentation is, because there's no fear that the rod or the electrode or the wire is below that standard. You guys have designed them to be above and beyond. That's yeah. not the problem, but it is the, the, the perception. Of, of because in Canada we are so standards heavy you know we are trained right from day one to follow standards and the U.S. has a number of standards organizations but they're selective and you can join certain ones if you want and not be a part of certain ones they're state by state you know so there's a lot of uh, there's no alignment within the U.S. for the standards and here in Canada we are aligned nationally so then, uh, you know, that was the conversation I had. I, we talked about it for about an hour saying, you know, as you guys come into Canada, be aware that that's going to be one of the first questions you get asked. You know, what does this, what will it do if I have a job where my company says you have to use, um, you know, uh, a low hydrogen rod, which is the F4 category, you know, so you're going into this. Okay, sure. Now, will a rock mount electrode fit or exceed that category, you know, like, will there be a chart that lays it out? And is, is that something you guys are working on or, or in the, in the bubble? Yeah, I think that's a very, very uh, important point when you think about rock mount products. And I, I think as we're talking here that you were, you were speaking of Robert McDonald, our West coast manager. Yes. Yeah. I think he's in California, isn't he? He's in California. That's Great right. Guy. That's who it was. Yeah. 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 Master <laughs> fabricator, by the way. Uh, incredible uh, metal worker. But mm -hmm. when we think about standards, we that automatically gets us into the conversation of, of where our products fit. For instance, when you're repairing a cracked backhoe bucket or a rock bucket that has broken, it very commonly will be if you didn't have any rock mount products, as an example, you would repair it according to process and procedure that you already have with production welding materials. Mm -hmm. What we would do when we go to see a customer who would say, hey, listen, we're, we, we fixed this bucket and now it's broken again, we would say, well, here's something better. It doesn't actually meet any of your standards it doesn't, it, it can't be quite as categorized, but it will work and we'll show you why and how. And so 
when we go to a customer shop, we're thinking a lot more about calling on the maintenance people as opposed to calling on the fabricators who would commonly steer more towards that, that fabrication process, procedure, and product. And so it's a different mindset of who we're talking with. When we get into, as we get in deeper into Canada and we're talking to customers who are saying, hey, we work in a steel mill, we have a boiler and, and we don't have a choice to use whatever we want. We have to use this, this process. We can always provide documentation that shows our products will exceed. And as our reputation grows, we hope that customers will start to realize that when they use a rock mount product, they can depend on it. But it's a, it's a process of, of building that. And, and, you know, just for the Canadian listeners, the welders and all the steel trades people that listen, WPS is, or, you know, the documentation required for welding is not a static thing. They're living documents. And that's something that people always need to remember because trust me, in my you know, almost 30 years in the trades, I have seen many standards change and many consumable requirements change up and down and they change according to industry and availability. And so, you know, as products come in, there is a testing process. And then when you eventually fall in love with X product, you will change your standards to conform to that product because you've decided this product is more viable. And yes, changing the standards will have a price tag, you know, $4,000 or whatever it is to get an engineer out and produce documentation and, and create the new standard. But if that product long-term is saving you 60 grand a year, it's nothing. It's nothing, you know? So, and, and those are the, and I've seen this play out many times, you know, like working with as stainless steels is a great example. Stainless steels are de developing every day. You know, there yeah. was no du there was no duplex 20 years ago, you know, right. and now duplex is all over the place. And I, I, in Saskatchewan, the province that I live here in Canada, we're heavy in the mining. We got uranium mines, potash mines, diamond mines. We got all sorts of mines. I spent much of my life working on and building mining equipment. The standards in mining have changed <laughs> like yearly because potash is such a volatile thing to mine it will eat through inches of steel you know <laughs> and, and 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 then you say well go fix that 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 conveyor well there's nothing of the conveyor left you know and and finding the right products for that is, is really key and you know i think that's where you guys are trying to get in yeah and i think you, you you've made a, a perfect point on that the problem with with standards on some of these things is they can't be standardized as an example, if you're welding on a piece of steel on a boom on a uh, some kind of heavy uh, excavator in a in a mine, well, whatever that metal was at one time, it very probably a little different now. Mm -hmm. the The contamination that you might have to weld through can't be identified. I I'll tell you a quick story. Years ago. The AWS, the American Welding Society, uh, one of the one of the um, folks in that uh, uh, society asked me to take a look at their maintenance welding program, and and uh, they had spent a lot of time on it. It was beautiful, but it was very much based in this idea that you could standardize uh, a problem. So when you had a piece of cast iron. You would take a chunk of the cast iron according to their the the their process, send it to the, your met lab, have it analyzed for base metal uh, composition and for contamination. When you get that back, build an oven, so on and so forth, the whole process. But the truth of of it is is that if you're in a mine and you have a broken exhaust manifold, and the boss is looking over your shoulder. And you're he climbing says, up there. <laughs> when I get back from lunch, that that thing better be running. You're not going to send it to a Met Lab. Who's going to do that? And yeah. so that's the idea with these products. There are in the maintenance world, it can be very, very hard to standardize uh, some process and a procedure. 
because you don't have all of the either time or the capability. And that's where you want to use a better welding product that was made for that work. Uh, and, and so it's for us, it's a two prong thing. One is just approaching the people who use these kinds of products. They realize this is so, uh, and then the, uh, at the same time, uh, letting everyone know that our products, uh, meet or exceed any standard that you would, you would need to, to fit. You know, and, and that's a fantastic distinction there. When you said the procedure that you built the product with is not the procedure you repair it with, you know, and, and for all the well wishing you that you hope to have in that situation, odds are it's not going to work. Well, I think of, uh, you can think of something very simply as a, think of a heavy equipment trailer in a, built in a factory. That's what my dad used to do. He used to, his, his, his company, they built trailers. But when that trailer is 10 years old, it's in Saskatchewan in the middle of the winter. It sat, uh, it's frozen into the, into mm -hmm. the ground. And the boss says, let's use that thing. But the tongue is cracked. Well, and, what are you going to use? Yeah, it's going to get used that day, mm -hmm. but the welding job is not what happened when they built that trailer. It's a different kind of welding, and this is the such the important distinction with our kinds of products, because it could be very hard to quantify that sit that particular situation. So you know, now going forward. I, I've received some of your guys' samples and I've gotten to play with them. And first of all, the packaging's nice. The colors are pretty. You know, <laughs> I, I noticed that you guys are taking time. I've always noticed that. I'll never forget when I first opened my first fancy rods. I think I was about 23. I had to do it. <laughs> I had to, I was working with a tool and die maker. So we were making, you ordered these special 95, 98s. They're called tool steel electrodes. And they're very high impact, very hard. They're for making stamping equipment, right? Uh, tool. Mm -hmm and die equipment, um, which has to be harder than anything else. And I'll never forget this fancy little package that came in and there was only like 15 rods in there, all 332s. And they were a pretty like orange rainbowy color. Mm -hmm. And that those 15 rods cost like $800 or something ridiculous, right. but, you know, but it was worth it. Cause it's, it's very specific product for a specific part. Right. And, and I think that you guys are kind of going on that. I've also noticed that you guys have gone into, you have GMAW wires, flux cores, you know, you got all sorts of the, of the wire processes, you know, where do you go from here? Where does rock mount look in terms of, you know, it's, it's growth now, not just in terms of market, but internally as a company. Well, we're, we're very forward thinking as far as products are concerned in the welding world. Uh, as you know, I, I grew up, in that same world as we talked about, uh, there is a lot of momentum to keep doing the same thing that we've always done. And uh, a perfect example of that is my, I gave my father who was, had a, a shop in the back of our house years ago, a really cool general purpose welding material that we make that would replace a 6010, which he loved. It literally took me a year to get my father to use a <laughs> box of our rod that I gave him for free because <laughs> he just liked what he did and and he would keep going. Once he used the box, he uh, he called me and said, hey, I ran out of that rod. I need another one, another box. And I said, I'm not giving it to you. You put me through hell for, for a year <laughs> and you wouldn't burn it up. So we, <laughs> we joked about that. But there's a lot of momentum to keep doing what you're always doing. And at Rock Mount, we're always thinking about what can we do that can make a maintenance welder's life and job easier? And how can we save the company some money on their equipment repair? So just to step back, back 20 years ago when wire got more common in maintenance shops, uh, uh, most customers were using fabrication welding materials, the same kind you'd weld a desk with up in a factory. Mm -hmm. And they would use that on a heavy equipment bucket or on a frame on a, a tractor or whatever it may be. We came out with welding materials in the wi in wire forms 
that were made for maintenance welding. So they did what our stick rod did. And so when you think of general purpose welding wire, uh, in the States, it's E70S6. It's kind of the standard. I think it's the same in Canada. Yeah. Um, but if you get something dirty, if you get a different kind of steel, if you get something that is uh, uh, a little bit other than everything perfect, you can really fight it. You can take our wire and weld through the dirtiest stuff you've got and get a x-ray quality weld. So uh, we're thinking about that all the time. We are, uh, we, we have a product um, that very few customers know about, but it, it's actually not new. Uh, uh, it's an arc gouge rod that replaces an air arc. You've probably used one. Uh, it looks like a welding rod, but it, it takes metal uh, out, gouging metal, piercing and such. Um, we are uh, working on some new wires that are highly alloyed that will weld any steel uh, and they're flux core that run with uh, a 7525 gas. So you don't have to have anything special to weld with wire a broken leaf spring and have it hold. Mm -hmm. uh, not that you're going to do that in on an over the road truck or anything <laughs> like that, I don't mean to say that, but that just is an example how tough that stuff is. It's 125,000 tensile and stretches 35%. That's so amazing, it's incredibly yeah. strong and ductile. And so uh, we're, we're working on those uh, kinds of products, all with that idea that there is something better uh, than what we have. Hard facing is a really good example. You can buy an expensive hard facing product downtown and there's nothing wrong with it, but you can buy a lot better hard face and when you think of hard facing, the whole purpose is to make it last a long time. And if it lasts longer, then it's probably going to be cheaper. And that's where that's where our vision is uh, of, yeah. of product growth. And and the ease of use too, because I've used specialty products that are difficult to use. You know, so for example, you'll buy a specialty rod for hard facing, for example, and for people that haven't done a lot of hard facing welding. Um, it's much different than your normal welding. You are going to be running at higher amperages. You're going to have to watch your arc length a lot differently because of the way the flux comes off. And you're going to have to learn how to use that arc force dial on your welder that you may have ignored for the last 20 years. You know, these things are, are a big part. And especially if you buy a lower grade hard surfacing electrode, you will have porosity. You will have a wandering arc. You will have all these issues. And, and not to say that the deposited weld, weld isn't as hard as they say it is. Of, of course it is. But just the process is difficult. And and when you buy a better suited electrode, um, they just run better. There's less fighting with the electrode to get it in there. We make a, a hard face wire that will weld vertical up like it's flat. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've stood behind a welder who was using various kinds of general purpose hard facing and these giant gobs of molten metal <laughs> are rolling out of the puddle and, mm -hmm. and 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 so he's got a weld uh, and he says you know this this is about the best i can get and he's sitting in kind of a pile of bb's <laughs> well, he paid for that that's all metal that he paid for and it yeah and he had to burn it to end up sitting, have it sitting on the floor. We think as an example, you know, when you think of hard facing, you would normally think of how does it run and how hard it is it. But there are other very important considerations. One is the one we just talked about. What's the recovery rate? How much of the metal that you bought and burned ends up on the base metal? Mm -hmm. Most welding materials, general purpose, have very low recovery rates. The other thing is how fast does it go on? So what's the deposition rate? Because time is one of a maintenance welder's biggest costs. And so if that hard-facing welding material will go on two or three times faster, you're way ahead of the game. And if the deposit ends up being harder too, and wearing longer, that's just kind of that's great. That's an added bonus, yeah. Yeah. 
And, and you know, it's funny because that you that you bring up the leaf spring. I actually took uh, one of your guys' electrodes and took two chunks of rusted old leaf springs from like the forties that someone gave me. I make some like gift knives and stuff out of this old fifty one fifty, and uh, I wanted because that's what they told me. They're like, this will weld through rusted leaf springs. I was like, you know what? I have some <laughs> rusted leaf springs. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. And I actually put them on Instagram and, and and shared it with you guys. And and right away, I got a good response saying, see, we told you so. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, and, and that's funny. interesting. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, you know, we, we talked a bit about this before, the idea of how do we become known? How do people hear about us, see what our products will do? There are there is so much momentum in the welding world that when we walk into a customer shop, we could talk with a welder who's been welding for 40 years and say, hey, I've got a welding alloy that will weld any steel. And if you ever wanted to weld a leaf spring or maybe in a more common application, you're a maintenance welder, you have a one-sided crack sensitive weld and you can't take the thing apart. You have to weld it from one side. Well, this welding rod will work. And uh, customers commonly say, well, I don't believe that. <laughs> that won't ever work. Mm -hmm. And so this is a big part of what we do. And it's important to us to put our money where our mouths are. We, we like to show a customer what our products do so that they can really see it. And talk is cheap. But when you see what it will do, uh, then very commonly uh, you, you will say, I, I've got applications for that. I've fought that before. Uh, it doesn't, I, I was at one of the big mines up in uh, Wyoming a, a few years ago. They, they had, I won't use any, any names of equipment, but they had a very large piece of uh, uh, yellow equipment that uh, <laughs> the, the that uh, narrows it down pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, the, 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 the company had come out to weld the the boss on the boom that had blown out and it was a huge weld and of course that pin holds the whole boom up without if that thing Those breaks are like six inch six or eight inch pins in that thing yeah oh yeah uh, yeah and they're like this big mm -hmm. and i i guess i'm not uh, uh given that no one saw how i my where With i put hands? my hands you know like eight eight or 10 inches uh, across some of them. Mm -hmm. Well, this was a big one. And the, the company that sells the equipment sent their welders out. They spent a fair amount of time repairing it and it only lasted a couple of days and it broke again. We happened to be in there. Uh, they said, do you have something that will work on this? And, and uh, I said, I, I think we do. Yeah. And so they bought a few rolls of wire and long story short, uh, uh, that was about, well, probably close to four years ago, and that thing's still running. Uh, the interesting part of the story maybe is that the maintenance superintendents were very, very thankful uh, for us that they used the wire because they'd won a a bet with the people that sold the yellow equipment that <laughs> what they'd done wouldn't work. <laughs> so they each won 100 bucks. Oh, that's and, awesome. Uh, and we got a good customer out of it. So and and you know so go ahead. I'm, I'm just going to say there's a big difference in welding material, even though they might look the same as far as a stick rod is concerned or a roll of wire. Mm -hmm. And and for the young or new to welding maintenance welders out there, uh, that's a very valuable piece of information I'll give you. Is that when something breaks, it's because there's been a failure, and the materials surrounding that failure are now less than optimal. So when you think about when something is built new, you're using optimal parent metal with optimal rod in an optimal scenario, and you're producing X product. When that product breaks through no fault of anyone, like fault is out the window, it's broken in front of you, whatever happened, what, what you're repairing it with has to be above optimal now. And that's just a simple rule because the, the cr around the crack, the material, the lattice, metallurgically speaking, has been compromised. And so you can't just fix it with the same material. So even if you wanted to think of it's a 65 to 70,000 tensile strength parent metal, 
in the repair process, you should be looking at 80 to 90,000 tensile strength to repair because you need to not only put in new material, but compensate for the weakness around it. And I, I, that's exactly right. And I would add one thing to that. We see this a lot. Customers commonly will, will, when they have a problem, think I need something with higher tensile strength. And they probably do. But in very, in typical welding products, as you go up in tensile strength, you go down, down. Mm -hmm. So this can be an even bigger problem. And that's what you're getting with, with rock mount products as an example. You're getting a highly, uh, a high rock well, or sorry, a, a high, high tensile strength, but you're also getting a very high elongation. The elongation is very commonly at that higher tensile strength, higher than what you'd get with a general purpose product at a lower tensile strength. So you've got to have both of them to make those kinds of repairs at to the highest level that you can. Yeah. Uh, well, it's awesome, you know, and while we're coming up to the end of the podcast, we've burnt an hour, Pat. Can you believe that? Wow. That was, <laughs> that's hard to believe it. It sure was fun. Yeah, no, it goes quick. And, and, you know, this has been a great conversation. I got a couple more questions just to wrap up the show. First of all, your career now, you know, but before the show, when we started talking, you said you're kind of one foot out the door, kind of thinking about it, you know, and we talked about my position now here at the CWB Association coming in after somebody who has been here decades, you know, what's your plans now? How, how are you dealing with the company? Are you looking at retirement? What, where's Pat going now? Well, uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I, my position uh, was uh, awarded to a, a wonderful gentleman named Gerald Abrams. And Gerald is the reason that we're talking. He is, is the, uh, one of, the, one of the, the real spark plugs in the company to expand our horizon. Um, uh, and Gerald has taken over my, my position. As we discussed earlier, my job now is to try to unload as much information out of my head into everyone else's head, uh, because a lot of the uh, a lot of the information I've got is I I think like any old guy uh, just gotten from the over the years. So Gerald has taken over my my position, done a wonderful job. Uh, he has four young managers that work for him. Robert McDonald is one of them. And uh, uh, they are, uh, they're just doing a, a knock up job. I, I'm supporting them uh, with videos, with technical information, with anything that I can do to impart that knowledge. So I'm working about a quarter time. I've technically retired the end of the year, but it doesn't seem like I have because I have no more time than I did before. I don't know how I had to, had time to do my job before, to tell you the truth. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And, you know, I, we're, we're probably all the same. Like, I, I this job that I work now, it's I'm, I'm in central Canada, but my head office is in eastern Canada. And I'm up at six every day, no matter what. And some of these, you know, some of my colleagues now are like, why are you up so early all the time? I was like, I worked at, you know, I had to be at work at six in the morning. I'd be getting up at 4.45, 4.30 in the morning for almost 30 years. Yeah. It's hard to get that out of my blood. Like I might be in a corporate position now, but yeah. uh, you don't change the way you work. It's kind of in you, you know? And and believe me, you're a young man compared to me. It <laughs> never, it doesn't get better <laughs> later. You, uh, there's no end. <laughs> there's no end to it. it and, and the beauty of it is, from my perspective, I know that I can help the young people who are coming up do better. And, and my only purpose, if you ask me what my, my, uh, my goal, my purpose is, is just to try to help the company grow and to help everybody I can with this knowledge that I've gained over the years. If they, if, uh, I, I, you know, I don't think this is a secret. If you can help somebody else, you're going to, you're going to look back in the mirror one day and say, boy, it was, that was, that was okay. I had a pretty good life. Helped a few people get someplace. 
Awesome. And now uh, for the last question, my, my this is my go-to question for everybody that's on the show. You know, now that you're looking at, uh, you know, a false retirement, I'll call it, <laughs> and, and and looking at uh, your career g- going back, what would you say to somebody who's young, looking to enter into the trades? And, you know, this is a fine example of exactly how wide the trades can be from sales to development to to the welders in the field, engineers, metallurgists, it's a wide spectrum, regardless of where you're coming. What advice would you give them going forward with their lives? I think I would say that you can't predict the future. You don't have complete control over it, but you do have complete control over yourself and your work ethic and your drive to get to a, a place that you'd like to be. And if you keep your eye on that goal and don't give up, uh, uh, when things get a little bit tough and you're, you're, you're looking in the mirror wondering what in the heck you did, that's the time to just keep going. And uh, uh, that's what I've learned over the years. Uh, I've gotten to where I'd like to be, or I, uh, my, my good friend who's my age uh, asked me uh, about what a little bit of retirement is like. And I said, you know what? Uh, if we talked when we were both 25, uh, this, uh, uh, and, and we said, uh, we outlined where we are right now, we would, we would have given anything, uh, to, uh, to end up at that spot, the spot that we are right now. And it all mm-hmm. came with just hard week work and determination. So that's my, that's my best advice. Awesome. Well, thanks, Pat. You know, I love this. And for the people that are interested in Rock Mount products, you can check them out online. Uh, they have a great website. Also, uh, they have teamed up with the CWB Association for our 100 years campaign. Um, we're, you know, we've teamed up with a lot of established companies and there's going to be some giveaways of their products through our giveaways in the next few weeks. So make sure that you stay uh, plugged into our social media to see what's coming up uh, with their products. Maybe you can get your hands on some of it. I got some, so you guys can't give me and can't take any of mine so (laughs) (laughs) pat you want to say something i i just like to say one other thing too Mm -hmm. we talked about us growing into canada and if there are any uh of your listeners out there who have sales personalities a sales background in the industrial world and they'd like to be with a company that they can have a home with we could be that company and we'd be happy to talk with them about that so i just like to get that plug in well, that's awesome because, you know, I, I do have uh, p- friends and people across Canada who are in sales and some of them are uniquely perfect because they were, are Red Seal welders that went into sales. And that's like the perfect combo. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Those are always the ones you can trust. So so make sure you tune into our social media. Check us check us out on our websites. Make sure you guys are taking care of yourselves in this crazy times and, and tune into this podcast. It's doing really well and I appreciate all the listenership. So, you know, Pat, thank you for being on the show and everyone, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. You've been listening to the CWB Association Welding Podcast with Max Serrano. If you enjoyed what you heard today, rate our podcast and visit us at cwbassociation.org to learn more. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions or suggestions on what you'd like to learn about in the future. Produced by the CWB Group and presented by Max Herman. This podcast serves to educate and connect the welding community. Please subscribe and thank you for listening.